Hello, everyone. Welcome back to a brand new season here at the Ward Beecher Planetarium. My name is Tiffany Stone Woolbrook. I am so, so excited to be here tonight with you all and uh, with the whole crew as well. Uh, I'd like to introduce our, our first, our students. We have Nishan here. Say hi, Nishan. Hello. And Ginny. Hello, everybody. And presenting tonight, we have Eleni. Hello. And Kurt. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome back again. We're really excited to share some of the latest astronomy with you all. Um, we are really sad that we aren't able to welcome you guys to the planetarium in person. Our doors do remain closed to the public, but we have planned a really exciting season unlike any other we've had before. We have five different show types that we're offering, show series uh, that the Keep Looking Up is just one of them. This is our ninth Keep Looking Up. We did these starting back last spring, but we're bringing them back this fall. We're also doing a starry story time and uh, where we read books with you and your family. We're doing science experiments, latest astronomy news, all kinds of really exciting show segments. You can find those uh, we, uh, on our Facebook and YouTube. We plan to publish those about two videos or so a week just for you guys to enjoy. And if you want to have those videos, just email to you directly if you aren't on social media too often. We have a mailing list. It's in the link on the chat in our Facebook and we'll include that in our YouTube description as well. You can just sign up to the mailing list and we'll send those videos straight to you. Now, uh, I was, I'm curious, where are people coming from today, tonight? Who is streaming uh, from Youngstown? Who's streaming out of, out of state? Let us know in the chat where you're coming from. I'm in low earth orbit, Tiffany. I'll be back down there in a little while. <laughs> All right, well, with our Keep Looking Up, we, uh, we're planning to talk a little bit about some of the moons in our solar system, the, not, the, not the one that goes around the Earth that we see all the time, but some of the really interesting moons that go around other planets in our solar system. Uh, but first, we're going to start with a uh, look at our current nighttime sky. So let me share that sky with you now. All right, so this is uh, a, a free open source software called Stellarium. You can download it yourself if you really, if you like what we're doing on our uh, videos and you think it looks cool, you wanna play around with it. Um, Stellarium.org, you can download it for free. I even have it as an app on my phone and I usually reference it when I wanna see um, where certain objects are in the sky and things like that. So a uh, very, very powerful piece of software that we're using to bring basically a virtual planetarium right to your screen. I have our virtual planetarium tonight set for this evening at about 930. So shortly after we uh, end our show tonight, you'll be able to go outside, uh, assuming it's clear weather where you are and look up. And this is about what you should see uh, if you're in the Youngstown area, at least. So, I have us facing north. Uh, it's a good idea to uh, orient yourself in the nighttime sky. And the best way to do that is to find the seven bright stars that make the shape of a big spoon in the sky. You guys probably know what this is. That's the Big Dipper, right? It's inside of the constellation Ursa Major. The uh, Big Dipper is actually not a constellation. It's just inside of that much larger one. But those seven stars that make up the big spoon are some of the brightest stars in Ursa Major, so it's easier to see that, especially if you're dealing with light pollution above your uh, backyard or wherever you happen to be looking. These two stars on the edge of the cup here, we've nicknamed those the pointer stars because if you draw a straight line through them like this, they will always point you to and if our regulars are on, I know you can you can probably answer with me. <laughs> The North Star or Polaris. 
This, this star is special because it hovers just above the Earth's north pole and that means that it remains fixed in our sky. It's the only star that never moves in our nighttime sky. So it can always point us north. It's like our nighttime marker. And uh, with that, we know where north is. We don't even need these uh, cardinals, these red letters at the bottom here to figure out where we're facing because we have our north star. Now, this time of year, the Big Dipper is kind of low. Ursa Major is kind of low in the sky. If you had some tall trees or something, it might be a little bit harder to see this if it's a little later in the evening, too. Um, another way that you can find the North Star is to find this, this, uh, this alphabet letter over here. This time of year, it looks, well, I guess an M or a W, either one. This is the constellation Cassiopeia, the queen she was, uh, she was a, a queen in ancient Greek and Babylonian mythology, and uh, it's supposed to be her sitting on her throne. I really just see the letter W. But the two brightest stars in Cassiopeia are right here. And if you draw a line through them, like you do with the pointer stars in the Big Dipper, it gets you pretty close to Polaris or the North Star. Not exactly, but it helps. So this is our north sky. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because even though it's really useful, it's up all year round, which makes it very, very useful. But also, uh, if you've been looking at the sky for a while, you've already seen it. It's, it's not as interesting as maybe some of our seasonal stars that you don't get to see all the time. So let's move over towards the east where we can see some of those. I specifically put us at 930 instead of 9 tonight because we have a planet rising. Right at 930, we have uh, the planet Mars rising. You probably won't get a good view of it till at least 10, 11, maybe midnight. That would be a good time to go see it if you really want a good, a good view of Mars, but it is rising over in our eastern sky. And along with Mars right now, rising in our eastern sky is our fall stars. It is not technically fall yet, but I was on a walk this morning, uh, or yesterday morning actually, and the, there were crunchy leaves on the ground. Really exciting, right? And the days are getting a little bit shorter. We can feel that the sun set around 7.30 tonight. Um, so fall is definitely right around the corner and the stars show us this. These four bright stars right here, they make up almost a perfect square or diamond in the sky. That is the fall square or the great square of autumn. It's also called, oh, not all of them, there we go. This is the great square of Pegasus because it makes the body of our flying horse Pegasus in the nighttime sky. And this really is sort of the centerpiece of the fall. When you see this big square popping up, uh, even if you are in a city with lots of light pollution on a clear night, you can usually find this, at least these four stars in Pegasus. Now, one thing I do like to mention, one of my favorite uh, objects to look at, you have to have really dark skies, so you might not be able to see this. Um, in your backyard or, or wherever is convenient to look. You may have to go way out into the country to see this. But connected to Pegasus here, this star here, it's called Alpha Rats, and it's shared by two constellations, Pegasus, the flying horse, and Andromeda, the princess. Now, uh, the princess, I kind of see her as an A. Solarium doesn't draw the other side of the A like this here. But right where her, her other, her small leg is here, or, or how I imagine where her hips are, you can see a very fuzzy patch of light. I'll zoom in here. With Solarium, the neat thing is you can kind of zoom in and see more detail as if you were looking through a telescope. So something that you couldn't see quite so well with your eyes. This is the only object that you can see with your eyes that is not in the Milky Way galaxy. Does anyone know what this is? <laughs> this is a galaxy all on its own. This is the Andromeda galaxy. It's our neighbor galaxy. 
Yes, that's a background galaxy further out too. So even though this is the closest galaxy to our Milky Way galaxy, it's over two and a half million light years away from us. That means that the light that you see, if you see Andromeda galaxy in the real night sky, the photons that are entering your eye left that galaxy two and a half million years ago. It's insane. That's why it's one of my favorite things to be able to see. I've only seen it a handful of times myself uh, without a telescope. Very, very, very faint, but pretty impressive. Let's go back to, this is about what you would see with just your eyes, no telescope. Now we'll head towards the south because there's a lot of interesting things happening in the south. And because it is still technically summertime, we do still see some of our summertime constellations found in the south. Uh, that's easy to remember, south, summertime, and most of them start with the letter S too, so that's easy. This summer, at least, it's been the summer for planet viewing for sure, we have a spectacular view of both Jupiter and Saturn. We'll be talking more about both of these planets in our, uh, later in our show, um, but we can, we can see them really, really easily. They look like very bright stars that don't really twinkle a lot uh, like the other stars. There's not as much uh, distortion when you are looking at them because they're much closer to us than the other star, than the stars in the sky. But, um, but Jupiter here, for example, another great thing about Solarium, if you did have a telescope, even a pretty basic one, you could start to see some little pinpoints of light around Jupiter. Jupiter is not the one with the rings, so these are not rings. They, Jupiter does have rings, but it's very, very faint. These are what we call the Galilean moons, which you'll learn more about with um, Kurt here. Ganymede and Io are right on top of each other, but these are Jupiter's four largest moons. And, um, you know, through a pretty decent telescope, you might be able to see something uh, about this good, but um, it also depends on where you live and what your, what your sky conditions are. So that's Jupiter. And then uh, if you do zoom in to Saturn, you can, in, in a telescope, even a basic telescope, you can actually see its rings. So they're probably not quite that well. <laughs> At least in my experience, it's a little more, a little more like that. Um, but uh, the moon, Saturn's, one of Saturn's largest moons, Titan, um, it might actually be the largest. I'll let you answer that, uh, Eleni. <laughs> uh, you can see that very visible tonight through a telescope. All right, so we have two planets, actually three if you stay up a little bit late. You have Mars in the east, you get if you uh, want to stay up late directly overhead. We call this the zenith. You just look up. We have one, two, three bright stars that make a triangle. You guys have been to my shows, you know. This is called the Summer Triangle. It's very, very easy to see. It's huge and bright in our sky. And if you do have dark, dark enough skies to see this milky band of light, that's the plane of our galaxy, the Milky Way, uh, the the Milky Way cuts right into the summer triangle. So there's a lot of detail in the summer sky in terms of the constellations and things. Uh, I'll just really quickly, because I, I want to wrap up and, and have time for our speakers, but I, I'll just show you some of the constellations you can see there. Cygnus the Swan, one of my favorite constellations in the uh, whole sky but definitely in the summer. Cygnus sort of glides along the Milky Way here. This is a, a swan. Uh, Vega at the top here is in Lyra, the harp. Altair is in Aquila, the eagle. And so the Summer Triangle actually is not a constellation. It's just the three brightest stars in three summertime constellations. So it's really uh, the summertime sky is sort of neat and tidy in that in that way. So zooming out, if you were just laying on the ground looking up, it's really, it's maybe a little towards the south, but those, that summer triangle is very high right now. 
and it'll just get it'll get lower and lower towards the west as fall goes on. We can actually see the summer triangle into the month of December, but it's way over into the west. Those stars slowly shift as the seasons change. Pretty cool. Now I do want to mention if you guys have any questions for us or for me, for our speakers later, please feel free to comment uh, in the Facebook chat. I would love to answer and engage with you as much as possible and our lovely moderators will uh, be happy to relay those questions for me. And there you have it. That's just a short little uh, look at our current nighttime sky. If you want to see more of that, um, we'll include those in all of our Keep Looking Ups, but we, we try to change it up and maybe give you a little bit of uh, mythology or lore or tell you some stories about those constellations as well. But I'm going to hand this over to Kurt now uh, as he talks a little bit about the Galilean moons. Here in my spaceship, yes, as we head out to Jupiter. Uh, so um, let me just share my screen screen here and start my slideshow from the beginning. That is not the beginning. Uh, that's the beginning. Started from the beginning. Okay. So um, we're going to talk about the Galilean moons. They're called that because they were discovered by the very famous astronomer Galileo. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But here with this first uh, uh, graphic, I wanted to show you that if these worlds were circling the sun instead of Jupiter, they are all very fascinating and could and are uh, some of the more interesting objects in the entire solar system. And we could actually do a show on each and every one. So here's the size of Earth and there's Mars. Ganymede is actually bigger than uh, the planet Mercury. It's uh, the largest moon in the solar system. Callisto is nearly that big, Io. There's our moon for scale and Europa is only just a little bit smaller uh, than uh, our own moon. So Earth actually does have a pretty gargantuan big moon. There's Titan in this group too. It's only slightly smaller than Ganymede, uh, but it's also very easy to see. Uh, the, these four moons were discovered by Galileo uh, between December 1609 and January 1610. He improved his telescope and it allowed him to see these four dots around Jupiter. And as he watched overnight, and that's my cat Merope, she's just saying hello, um, and these four dots would shift over the course of several nights. And what you're seeing on the right here is actually what he was observing. So there's Jupiter, Io, Europa, Ganymede. Using programs like Stellarium, we can actually go back and recreate what he was actually looking at in January of 1610. I do want to point out that as he was making these, uh, as he was doing these observed observations, this is really uh, prior to this point in history Astrology and astronomy were the same thing. Uh, people looked to the stars so they could make horoscopes and things like that. However, when Galileo started using a telescope on the sky and proved how nice it is. Uh, sorry, uh, we will remove the cat from the spaceship here. You know, cats on synthesizers in space. No, silly kitty. Yeah, well, we got her. Okay, anyway. Um, uh, that's where science started to go with theory and stuff like that. And astrology started, you know, wondering how many, if we should count the planets around other stars and uh, just bamboozling you with stuff. So I'm not going to get into that this evening. Um, the Galilean moon, uh, uh, the discovery of these celestial bodies uh, were the first thing that there was serious blood is something known as the Ptolemaic model. Before Galileo observed these objects going around Jupiter, uh, the model of the universe was the Earth was the center of everything, and everything in the universe went around the Earth. And he proved that, hey, these things aren't going around the Earth, they're going around Jupiter. Um, Galileo initially named them the Cosma Siberia, which means cosmos stars, uh, but the names that eventually prevailed were chosen by a gentleman named Simon Marius. Marius discovered the moons independently 
at nearly the same time as Galileo, and he gave them their presence names, which were derived from the lovers of Zeus. I'm not going to go too much into that, uh, other than to say that Greek mythology is some pretty racy stuff, and Zeus is the top of the food chain in Greek mythology. Uh, enough said on that. Uh, the four Galilean moons were the only known moons of Jupiter until the discovery of Amalthea on the fifth moon of Jupiter on, in 1892. Uh, I just saw today that, uh, that's our clock here at, on the spaceship chiming, you'll have to pardon me, uh, that uh, a study suggests we've, I can't remember what the actual number of moons is now, I think we're over 100. Uh, Jupiter could have 600 moons going around it. 600. So uh, more on that as uh, our instruments get better and we can discover more of these. But let's move on and take a look at these four fascinating worlds. I'm going to start closest to Jupiter and work my way out. The Well, okay, first, uh, these are very much like worlds that go around the sun. Uh, three of the four moons, Io, Europa, and Ganymede, have an iron core at the center and molten areas around uh, those areas. The only one that doesn't is Callisto, and it has mostly iron mixed with ice in its middle instead. So these are very much like the rocky planets inside Mars, Venus, Earth, and Mercury. Let's go on to Io, though. Uh, this is the innermost moon of Jupiter, and for those of you who haven't dinner yet, haven't had dinner yet, yes, it looks like a pizza. Um, with over 400 active volcanoes, Io is the most geolog geologically active object in the entire solar system. Every single one of those little black dots that you see on its surface is an active volcano, and the colors that you see on um, Io are all compounds of sulfur, which means if you err on uh, Io without breathing equipment on, which you would die pretty quickly, uh, you would smell sulfur. These are all compounds of sulfur, so this planet smells, this moon smells like rotten eggs uh, because of all the sulfur all over the surface. Now, why is uh, this uh, so active? Well, that's because it's the closest moon to Jupiter, and Jupiter has a ton of gravity. So it has an elliptical orbit, which means it's egg-shaped. So sometimes it's closer to Jupiter, sometimes it's further away from Jupiter, and because of that, Jupiter tugs on it with different amounts, and that causes tidal pumping inside, which creates friction and creates a ton of heat. Now, it's not proven but recent data from the Galileo orbiter indicate that Io might have its own magnetic field. That hasn't been proven yet. Io has an extremely thin atmosphere made up of mostly sulfur dioxide. And uh, if you look at the surface with all these volcanoes, this moon is literally turning itself inside out every few months of Earth time. So you don't see any craters from asteroids and things on the surface because this moon is literally turning itself inside out from all that volcanic activity on the surface. So wouldn't be a pleasant place to live, but it is one of the more fascinating objects in the solar system. The next moon out is uh, one that intrigues NASA the most, that is Europa. It is the second of the four Galilean moons and is the second closest to Jupiter and the smallest of these big moons, uh, slightly smaller than our own moon. The name comes from the mythological Phoenician noblewoman Europa, who was courted by Zeus and became queen of Crete. Um, it has a smooth, bright surface with a layer of water surrounding the mantle of the planet, thought to be 100 kilometers thick. The smooth surface indicates uh, it includes a layer of ice, uh, which could be about 100 kilometers thick, and underneath that ice uh, that's frozen, uh, we believe there is a vast ocean of liquid water. The apparent youth and smoothness of the surface uh, has led to uh, the fact, has put all these lines and fissures across the surface. Um, and had led to the hypothesis that oceans exist beneath. And if it's true, 
we now think Europa has more liquid water on its surface, even though it's only a little smaller than the moon, it has more liquid water on its surface than the planet Earth. Now, uh, when we are thinking of life on Earth, the key ingredient that makes life possible here on Earth is water. So Europa is one of the top candidates in our entire solar system where extraterrestrial life may exist. We haven't found any yet, but it could be underneath the surface. And our cat in space has come back into the spaceship. I'll just push her back out there. Uh, and my co-pilot's going to take care of that. Um, there are, uh, the uh, you will see on the surface, oh, let me show you the cracks and fissures a little better. This was from the uh, Galileo mission as it went over. Uh, and what's going on is the ice actually has geysers and water volcanoes that shoot off of the surface, which split the surface and then spread over. Of course, it's no atmosphere or a very, very thin oxygen atmosphere over top. So it smooths back over, turns to ice and smooths back over. But the, you might see some reddish uh, colors on the surface too. That's because Io is so active. Uh, it's spewing sulfur out in space and some of those compounds actually get over to Europa. So uh, let's move on to the next moon. That's the largest moon in the solar system. This is Ganymede named after the uh, cupbearer of the Greek gods and Zeus's beloved. And I'm not going to go any more into that. Uh, Ganymede is the largest natural satellite in the solar system. Uh, and even though it is larger than Mercury, it has only about half the mass. Mercury is mostly iron and rock. Uh, Ganymede has a ton of ice uh, going on here too. So it's only about half the mass of Mercury. It's the only satellite in the solar system that we know that possesses a magnetosphere. The reason for that is just like with Io and Europa, we've got tidal friction going on inside this too. So around its iron core, there is actually a molten layer of iron, just like on Earth. The reason we have plate tectonics is we have a solid core and then we have molten iron around that and the plates of the earth float around. That creates plate tectonics. That same thing is going on in here. And the same reason we have a magnetic field on earth, Ganymede has a magnetic field as well. Ganymede is composed primarily of silicate rock and water ice and a saltwater ocean is to believe, is believed to exist nearly 200 kilometers below uh, Ganymede's surface sandwiched between layers of ice. The metallic core of Ganymede suggests greater heat at some time in its past than we previously thought. And the surface uh, mixes two types of terrain, and I can show you that here. Uh, highly cratered dark regions, uh, which uh, have been there for a really, really long time. And then it has these grooves as well, uh, the, uh, which are younger but still very ancient. And that, what's that is the ice underneath, just like plate tectonics on Earth, has heaved up and created these ridges and things on the surface. Many of uh, the craters on Ganymede are gone, but some are only barely visible. Because of this water underneath, the entire outside of the uh, moon is actually covered in a thin glaze of ice. Uh, around it. And it is possible that there's a very, very thin oxygen atmosphere around Ganymede as well. Uh, the last one I'm going to talk about is the next largest of the Galilean moons and the fourth out. This is Callisto. You know, I mentioned, I said inside, this one does not have the iron core in the middle. Uh, it is the third largest moon in the solar system after Ganymede and Titan, which uh, you'll hear about shortly. Uh, and it's barely smaller than Mercury, uh, but it's only about a third of Mercury's mass. It's named for the Greek mythological nymph Callisto, a lover of Zeus who was a daughter of the Arcadian king Ly Lycaon uh, and a hunting companion of the goddess Artemis. Uh, it's the least dense of the Galilean moon and one of the most heavily cratered satellites in the entire solar system. And its main feature is this crater here, which is called Valhalla. 
And Callisto is surrounded by an extremely thin atmosphere composed of carbon dioxide and probably molecular oxygen. Investigation revealed that Callisto may possibly have a subsurface liquid ocean as well uh, at depths less than 300 kilometers. Uh, the likely presence of an ocean within Callisto indicates that there, that it might be able to harbor life. We think Europa is the best candidate for that, but Ganymede and Callisto may be able to as well. We don't know at this point. And uh, Callisto has long been considered the most suitable place for a human base for future exploration of the Jupiter system, since it is the furthest from the intense radiation of Jupiter. So, uh, like I said, those are four worlds in and of themselves, and really each could get its own show if we wanted to go into it with more depth. But uh, you, you should appreciate uh, these bodies, and uh, there are many other fascinating moons in our solar system as well. And for that, I'm going to turn you over to our other uh, presenter tonight, and that is a lady who is going to tell you about something she is working on with the second largest moon in the solar system. Thank you, Kurt. Hello, everyone. I'm going to share my screen here. So, as Tiffany mentioned, I'll be talking about Saturn's largest moon, Titan, because it is the focus of my research. But before I start talking about Titan, I do want to talk a little bit about how I got into this area of research. So I am an undergraduate student at YSU. This is my fourth year, and I plan on graduating in the spring. And I'm a physics and astronomy major with minors in geoscience and math. When I started at YSU, I was very interested in a field called astrobiology, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a combination between astronomy, the study of stars, planets, and other objects in space, and biology, the study of life. So astrobiology is basically the study of life in space. Astrobiologists want to know if life exists elsewhere in the universe, how it would be different or similar to the living things we see on Earth, and how or where we could potentially find other living organisms in the universe. Throughout my first few years of college, I took several geology classes and I fell in love with geology, which, by the way, is the study of Earth's surface and how it changes over time. In addition to astronomy and biology, I learned about a field called planetary science, which is where astronomy meets geology and also happens to be closely related to astrobiology. And at that point, I was pretty confident that I wanted to be a planetary scientist or someone who studies the structure of other planets. Last year, I was applying for programs called REUs, which stands for Research Experiences for Undergraduates. REUs are great opportunities that are offered by other institutions in which undergrad students get to travel to another place for a summer and do research with experts in their field. As you might have guessed, these programs are highly competitive, with hundreds of students from all over the country applying to each one. Unfortunately, I didn't get chosen for an REU. However, I did get to speak to a planetary scientist from the SETI Institute. SETI stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, and the SETI Institute is a nonprofit research organization that's located in Mountain View, California. The SETI Institute consists of many types of scientists, including astronomers, planetary scientists, astrobiologists, physicists, chemists, environmental scientists, geologists, climate scientists, and more. They also do education and outreach in those fields. But even though I didn't get chosen for an REU program with the SETI Institute, the planetary scientist that I spoke to, Dr. Pascal Lee, expressed interest in doing research with me anyway. Dr. Lee is not only a member of the SETI Institute, but he is also a chairman of the Mars Institute, and director of the NASA Houghton Mars Project at NASA Ames Research Center. However, as you know, I'm not doing Mars research with him. We decided to look at something entirely different, Titan. Unfortunately, I can't tell you too much about our research until it's published, but I have done a lot of reading about Titan and it's a very fascinating place. So I'll be telling you about Titan and why it's interesting to planetary scientists. So Titan is the largest moon of Saturn, everyone's favorite gas giant planet that's known for its beautiful system of icy rings. And Titan was discovered by Dutch astronomer Christian Huygens in 1655. 
Huygens was inspired by Galileo's use of telescopes to discover the four large moons of Jupiter. And as telescope technology improved, he was able to discover Titan. This makes Titan the sixth moon that was discovered behind the four Galilean moons and Earth's moon. It was not given the name Titan until the mid 1800s by John Herschel, who also named several other large satellites of Saturn. Titan is the second largest moon in the solar system, right behind Jupiter's moon Ganymede, and is larger than the planet Mercury. Just like Earth's moon, Titan is tidally locked, meaning that the same side of Titan is always facing Saturn. This is because the moon's rotational period is the same as its orbital period, so the time it takes for the moon to rotate around its axis and the time it takes for the moon to orbit the planet are the same. This is really common among large moons in the solar system, and it's due to the strong force of gravity between more massive satellites and their host planets. So there are a lot of features of Titan that makes it unique. One of them is its relatively dense atmosphere. Titan is the only moon in the solar system that is known to have a substantial atmosphere. Right now you're seeing an image of Titan in visible wavelength light, meaning that if you could fly out to Titan and see it, this is what it would look like. It appears to be very cloudy, so it's difficult to decipher any features on the surface. Astronomers used to think that Titan was larger than Ganymede due to its dense atmosphere blocking the surface and making it appear larger than it actually is. Titan's atmosphere, like Earth's atmosphere, is mostly composed of nitrogen, which is unlike any other object in the solar system. We haven't seen another object that has a dense nitrogen atmosphere. However, Titan's atmosphere also contains many hydrocarbons, such as methane and ethane. Since Titan is smaller than Earth and therefore does not produce as much gravity, its atmosphere also extends much farther out into space. This makes the atmosphere extremely opaque in many wavelengths, not just visible light. So Titan is very difficult to observe from Earth, and its surface features have been unknown for a long time. Additionally, its atmosphere is protected by Saturn's magnetic field 95% of the time, but 5% of the time, Titan travels outside of Saturn's magnetic field, and its atmosphere is vulnerable to solar winds. So much like Venus and Mars, which don't have strong magnetic fields to protect them, some of Titan's atmosphere is stripped away during the time that is outside of Saturn's magnetic field. Fortunately for us, Earth has a strong mag magnetic field that protects our atmosphere from the solar wind. So how do we know anything about Titan if we have this dense atmosphere in the way? That's where the Cassini-Huygens mission came into play. This mission consisted of two elements. The Cassini orbiter, named for Giovanni Domenico Cassini, who discovered Saturn's ring divisions, as well as several of its satellites, and the Huygens probe, named for Christian Huygens, who, as I mentioned, discovered Titan. Cassini-Huygens was a very informative mission, providing us with loads of information about Saturn and Titan, as Cassini was the first space probe to orbit Saturn and Huygens was the first lander to visit Titan. Cassini completed over 100 flybys of Titan, each one uncovering more and more information about Titan's surface. Cassini was equipped with several instruments that could essentially see through Titan's atmosphere by collecting wavelengths of light that are not visible to humans, such as radio waves and infrared. And the Huygens probe was able to take pictures and gather information about the surface of Titan. And just as a quick aside, at the end of the mission in 2017, the Cassini orbiter was deliberately crashed into Saturn. Uh, this was to prevent biological contamination of any of Saturn's moons that could potentially hold life. So this picture here is an artist's conception of Cassini as it was entering Saturn's atmosphere to crash into Saturn. <laughs> uh, does anyone have any questions before I keep going? No questions? All right. Okay, so now that I've made you wait, what did the Cassini-Huygens mission actually discover? What is on the surface of Titan? So here is a really cool artist conception of Titan's surface based on what we know from the Cassini-Huygens mission. So you can see Saturn in the sky through the thick haze from the nitrogen hydrocarbon atmosphere. Perhaps the most interesting thing though are these bodies of liquid. Titan is the only body in the solar system, other than Earth, that has an active hydrological cycle. This means that there are standing bodies of liquid on Titan that evaporate into the atmosphere, form clouds, and fall back down as rain. The 
only other place in which this happens is on Earth. Of course, on Earth, we see rain and lakes in the form of water, but on Titan, the liquid is made up of hydrocarbons, methane and ethane. It's far too cold for water to exist on a, as a liquid on Titan. It's only about 95 Kelvin there, which is negative 300 degrees Fahrenheit. But based on the density of Titan, which has been determined using information about its apparent size and its calculated mass due to gravity, we do know that Titan's crust is likely made up of water ice, like some of Jupiter's Galilean moons. That means that all the landforms on Titan, such as the hills and the mountains that you see in this artist's conception, are mostly made of water ice, which is essentially rock at the extreme cold temperatures on Titan. But to show you some actual data from the Cassini-Huygens mission, here's a video that was made by stitching together images from the Huygens probe during its descent to the surface of Titan. So I'm not going to show this whole video. It's pretty long. But if we skip ahead here, here it is entering Titan's atmosphere. And you can see some of those features that we talked about, some mountains and some hills, and then as we get closer and continue to move in and actually land on the surface, you see these chunks of rock. Again, this is water ice, um, and the surface is kind of dusted with a frost of those hydrocarbons, that methane and ethane that we talked about. So that is from the Huygens probe, but I also have some Cassini data here. So this is a false color image created using radar data from the Cassini orbiter. And it shows the lakes of Titan in blue and the sur surface of Titan in that yellowish brown color. Keep in mind, this is not what Titan actually looks like since we can't see through Titan's atmosphere and the colors aren't accurate since this is a false color image. But as you can see, there are several small hydrocarbon lakes and even some larger seas. Uh, these are similar in size to the Great Lakes that we see on Earth. So all of these features of Titan that I've told you about make it super interesting to all types of scientists. Chemists are interested in the mix of chemicals that are present. Geologists are interested in the landforms that have been observed. Climate scientists are interested in the methane cycle in the atmosphere. And biologists are interested in the potential for hydrocarbon-based life. So due to overwhelming interest in Titan, NASA recently announced a new mission called Dragonfly which will land on the surface of Titan and take advantage of its dense atmosphere to fly around to different locations. And Dragonfly will look at chemical processes that may suggest early signs of life in addition to gathering data about the climate lakes and landforms on Titan. It has several different targets, including the dunes that are located near Titan's equator, lakes that are located near Titan's poles, and the bottom of an impact crater. Impact craters are especially rare on Titan, um, unlike other moons, because Titan's atmosphere causes any potential meteorites to burn up before they reach the surface, and its surface is geologically active, so many craters may be erased. Uh, Dragonfly is scheduled to launch in 2026 and won't arrive at Titan until 2034. Maybe one day humans will develop the technology to visit Titan themselves, but for now, we continue to study it from afar. We're still learning new things about Titan every day as scientists continue to interpret data from the Cassini-Huygens mission. But I'm super excited to see what's published in the future and I can't wait to continue to do research on Titan. But that is all I have for you. So are there any questions before we wrap up? Yes, we have several questions here. Okay. Uh, uh, for me as well. Answer them. We have some great questions. Uh, so well, how did Titan get its name? How did Titan get its name? So Titan was named by John Herschel in the mid 1800s and uh, it comes from uh, Greek, I don't know what to call them, Greek Titans. Uh, there are other uh, moons of Saturn also named by John Herschel that are named for different Titans in Greek mythology as well. Yeah, I believe Titans were the, the parents of the gods or something. Something like in, in <laughs> Greek mythology lore. Uh, you are correct, Tiffany. M Michelle asks, is it liquid methane? On so time? yes, uh, this picture actually that I'm showing here is an artist's conception of one of those big 
seas that are like the Great Lakes. Um, and yeah, the, the lakes are liquid. Uh, methane and ethane freeze at about 90 Kelvin. And like I said, it's 95 Kelvin untightened. So it's just warm enough for it to be liquid. That's crazy, liquid methane. And um, Michelle also asks, what, what gives Titan its orange color? So that is because of the composition of its atmosphere, the, uh, the hydrocarbons and the nitrogen. I'm not sure exactly which elements it is, but uh, it just, it has that thick, hazy atmosphere. And it also, um, as the light passes through it, it scatters the light and makes it appear orangish red. I can get a little technical on that. Our uh, scattering here on Earth's atmosphere is called Raleigh scattering. And it's a function of the wavelength of the light. And due to our density, it's a certain ratio of the wavelength. And because Titans is so much thicker, uh, more of the blue is scattered away and uh, less of the yellow is. Uh, on Earth, we see the blue because the blue uh, scatters. Uh, it's further down the uh, spectrum on Titan. Right, and the same reason we see sunsets as appearing more orange on Earth is because the sun is lower on the horizon, so it has more atmosphere to travel through, but on Titan, the atmosphere is much thicker. Like I said, uh, the, the gravity is not as strong, so the atmosphere extends outward a lot farther, so the light has a lot more to travel through. You guys have lots of great questions tonight. Matthew asks, Going back to solar winds, is there a process which would replenish the atmosphere or would Titan's atmosphere eventually become depleted over a long amount of time? That is a very good question that I do not know the answer to. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if we, if we uh, know, if scientists know that answer or not. Um, we're still learning a lot about Titan and its atmospheres. Uh, it's, there's a lot of questions, a lot of uh, research being done. So yeah, for sure. I don't know. I mean, at some point, uh, yeah, in, in the order of billions of years, I think something would happen um, due, due to our sun. Our sun um, in about four and a half, five billion years will expand out to Jupiter's orbit. Uh, and I, can, I, I have to imagine that that would affect even the moons around Saturn. Uh, somehow, but I don't know that we know exactly. I have heard speculated that when the sun turns into a red giant and swallows Earth and Mars, uh, that conditions on Titan will become more Earth-like because of the distance away. It'll be getting more heat from the sun at that point, even though the sun's cooled down well, and expanded out. Right. We, we think because the our, the solar system is, is our, you know, galactic backyard that we know all these details, but there's so much about just our solar system that we are still trying to uncover. Um, for example, Kurt mentioned that when our sun swells and becomes a red giant, it'll swell. Don't worry, four tomorrow. billion years away. You don't have to worry yeah. about it absolutely not happening tomorrow. Although, uh, you know, if it did in 2020, <laughs> who would be surprised, right? Uh, <laughs> but um, there's, so we, we don't actually know what's going to happen to Earth and Mars. So, you know, there's, some believe that they, it, the sun will swallow Earth and Mars and, and then go out to about where Jupiter is. Oh, also Mercury and Venus are in there too. Uh, but some people are, are kind of are simul making simulations that suggest that the planet's orbits would be pushed out. Uh, certainly life as we know it on Earth would be toast. Uh, <laughs> but um, whether or not our, our rock that we live on would still be there, I don't even know how confident we can say what exactly is gonna happen. And there area. you're seeing the effects of all these exoplanets we have discovered. We thought we knew how planets formed and maintained their orbits based on looking at our solar system. But then we started finding all these planets around other stars behaving completely different. And so it's thrown our, uh, uh, how these things happen into question. Yeah, as any scientist knows, 
uh, having a, a sample of one is not very good. <laughs> so our sample for solar systems up until about 25, 30 years ago was ours, one. And so we assumed that, for example, all planets, first of all, we didn't know for sure that planets uh, formed around other stars. We know that now. Uh, other stars have planets around them. It's actually kind of common. But the 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 structure of our solar system where we have the rocky planets on the inside and then the gas giants on the outside, that is not common. We thought that that was sort of the basic structure of what a solar system would be or how it would form around a star like our sun. But even other stars like our sun that has planets, they often have what we call hot Jupiter. So big, big gas planets that are very close to the sun or to its star. So it, it's, it's pretty interesting. I think uh, Kurt has a good point that as we learn more about exoplanets, um, we might be able to better understand um, what's going to happen to the planets in our solar system as our star ages. And if anybody has any questions about the four Galilean moons, just let me know too. Yeah. Well, um, well, we'll stay on for a little bit to see if we do have... Um, any other questions, but uh, I'll take this time as we're waiting to see if we have any last minute questions. Just to thank you all so much uh, for, for bearing with us for uh, a few technical difficulties here. Um, it's 2020, it happens. <laughs> we, uh, we really enjoy this time with you and um, uh, we We'll hope to see you back. Uh, we're doing these every other Saturday, so every second and fourth Saturday of the month. Just check our Facebook event schedule. We'll have those up. Um, our next Keep Looking Up will be all about uh, big astronomy. So the uh, we'll talk about the big teams of people that it takes to accomplish these really big science, uh, ach scientific achievements. It's not just one. It, it's not like Galilean times where there was one dude with a telescope looking out make it and then writing notes in his uh, notebook it's, <laughs> uh, and don't be so modest is... uh, tiffany you got to go to chile to <laughs> for, for this particular project this is a big deal and uh, we wish we could bring you the planetarium show because it is killer and we will as soon as we get back but <laughs> Uh, th this was a project that Tiffany is involved with. She is an ambassador for this organization, and she's got some great uh, pictures and uh, stories about uh, all this. Absolutely. So, so next time, uh, next show, we're going to be uh, streaming. I don't know the technical logistics of this, but we're going to um, Big Astronomy. Their Facebook will be streaming a uh, 360 degree, like a virtual reality version of the show itself. So since we can't see it in the planetarium dome, you'll get to still see it on your computer um, or your tablet or a VR set if you have one. But then come um, see it in the planetarium when we open. Yes, definitely. It's much better. And it, it, was, it was produced and developed to be a planetarium show, but we're putting it online for people to enjoy. Um, and then we will come back here as well and have some discussion. We can share some stories, answer some questions for you guys about that particular topic. Um, next week as well, we're going to have uh, two new shows, uh, a starry story time where I'll read to you guys uh, about one of my very favorite astronauts. So I'm really excited to share uh, the newest starry story time with you. And then Kurt is leading our other show. You want to tell them about that? Out of this world news! I'll be sharing uh, kind of what Tiffany did with the Stellarium. Or if you come to our planetarium shows, there's the Sky Almanac that is up before the show starts. I'll be sharing you upcoming astronomical events, uh, things you can see in the night sky, upcoming space missions, and some things like that just to keep you up on what's going on in space and astronomy. Um, we have a couple questions that have popped up. Mm. Sorry about that. Matthew asks, oh wait, no, we already answered that one. Michelle asks, when uh, we find gas giant exoplanets that are close to their other stars, like those hot Jupiters I was talking about, um, how does their atmosphere not get blown away by the solar winds? 
actually some of the ones that we see are rapidly losing their atmosphere. Mm -hmm. uh, we are just speculating at this point because we've only started finding these in the last decade or so. Uh, but we think they form further out and something makes them spiral in to have closer orbits. Because the model we had of our solar system was all the planets have rocky cores the ones that were close to the sun, the solar wind blew the gas off out into space and we were left with the small rocky planets, but the big ones like Jupiter that had a lot of gravity, the ones that were farther out, were able to hold on to that gaseous envelope. We don't know if that's how they form. We don't know if they now form out there or if gas giants can form close to the stars, but we're studying these. Uh, what's the name of the mission, Tiffany, that's taking a look? Is it TESS? that's now studying, because Kepler looked at one small part of the sky and found literally 3,000 planets around other stars. Now TESS is not looking at one part of the sky, it's looking all over the place, but at nearby stars that would have planets. And we're putting these data sets together and seeing if we can make inferences by all these planets we find. Yeah, there's still a lot to learn with exoplanets. We actually have three missions. Uh, one of the newest hopefully. branches of astronomy. Yeah, uh, so TESS is, as you mentioned, it stands for Transiting Exo Exoplanet Survey uh, Satellite, I believe. Yeah. Something like so that. So it, it's yes. almost like a continuation of Kepler. It, it's going to be observing exoplanets in a very similar manner that Kepler did. But we also have uh, W first. I don't know its status they, right now. They renamed it. It's got okay. a different name now. Okay, I, I have to, to check into that one, but that's also, uh, I believe its primary mission will be exoplanets or, or one of its uh, big mission goals. And, and then, then, then JWST yeah. will be doing a lot of different things, but we'll also be looking at, at exoplanets. However, we do say so, in the astronomy field, most people believe in Santa Claus, astronomers believe in JWST. Yeah, Because we Santa don't Claus. know when it's going to take off. It was supposed so. to come out October 2018, and we're still waiting for it to be launched. But <laughs> yeah. I did away. hear they got the final mirror in the telescope now, so. Elena, you had something. Sorry. No, I was just agreeing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys so much for uh, sticking around. This is some great dialogue. We will, uh, we will see you later this week in some of our other videos, and then... Uh, stay tuned for our keep, next Keep Looking Up on September 26th. Uh, so thank you all. In the meantime, don't forget to keep looking up.